Um, we talked about VC capital versus banking capital. So that's everything I'm going to kind of talk about here. Uh, my focus here is on the relationship between venture capital and Black entrepreneurship. So the capital flows and relationships both ways there. So I'll start off with a quote from Muhammad Ali. I ain't getting nothing the dog ain't got. So it really ain't nothing in this integration keyword. I need some land, I need some jobs, I need something so we can build for ourselves. So this was a time when integration already taken place in the 60s and had been done, and he's not really seeing any of the benefits from it. Um, I'm framing my paper here um, as a extension for 1968 Kerner Report. Uh, some of the guys at the previous session, or maybe some of you guys here might have been familiar with this. So uh, Lyndon Johnson, president of the U.S., uh, act for a report. There were race riots going on in the U.S., physical, violent race riots. And this commission came to the conclusion that there's two societies here, a white society and a black society, separate and unequal. So the Kerner Report of 1968 emphasized a need for employment, black employment. There was a high rate of black unemployment. What I'm going to do, though, in the modernized versions, emphasize a need for black entrepreneurship and black em employers. So job creators, not job takers. So some more context on how things have gone, where we are today. I'm not the first person in this conference to mention the widening black white wealth gap. So I'm just going from 83 up into 2024. And you see, even since 83, it's widened. But if we went back further to World War II, it would look more dramatic. Um, so Ali didn't use this word, but six years later, after the original Kerner Report, he was calling for entrepreneurship. He was talking about ownership and being able to do for yourselves. Um, so we've had a third civil rights movement, if you will. Uh, the gentleman in the front who wears the Black Lives Matter shirt every day. So that's an example of what was overt in the 60s and became what they call covert riots in the 80s has returned to being overt again. So the problem from the original Kerner report really hasn't been solved yet. So this is my area of specialty as a finance professor um, talking about investments and valuation. So I have three basic challenges to Black founders, Black entrepreneurs, Black business owners. And the first is one that I know well because my area is behavioral finance, investor bias. So one of the ways that we can talk about investor bias that we haven't talked about before in finance is racial bias. Yeah. Traditionally, we talk about psychological biases that affect how you perceive stocks, how you perceive bonds, but not how you perceive founders of businesses. So that bias can affect Black entrepreneurs in several ways, valuation being one. So I asked the gentleman before how his valuations go when he deals with venture capital. Uh, VC, as he mentioned, is much more subjective. So they're kind of picking a number based off of feel, based off of trust and relationship, like he said. So VCs might have a downward bias to how they value a Black firm, which might be on the paper equivalent to a white firm. Uh, another one that hasn't been talked about is dilution. So for you non-finance people, uh, you start off as an entrepreneur, as a founder, you own 100% of your business. As you receive equity capital, the percentage of your business that you own gets diluted and decreases. And that dilution might be greater for Black entrepreneurs than for white entrepreneurs, depending on how the relationship with venture capital goes. Now I'm moving into an area that's not my expertise, uh, that was what we called maybe the hard side of VC. Now the soft side of VC, network bias. Again, I'm going to start to integrate the last session where he said trust was the main thing when it comes to getting capital from VCs. So network bias, fit, social capital, that trust relationship might not be equal uh, when you're doing in-group relationship versus out-of-group relationship. So there's something you psychologists might know called familiarity bias. And when traditionally white male VCs uh, have a familiarity bias with other white males, and then they meet, say, a young black talented founder, 
what should be trust, if everybody had familiarity with each other, won't be there to the same degree. Um, this is what you call social capital versus my first bullet point was financial capital. Um, the third challenge, the third bullet point, would be how much money the founders themselves have. So we know famous stories of Trump, Kushner, um, Elon Musk. They come from wealth. They don't, they're not building something from scratch. Versus if you don't come from wealth and you're trying to found something, there's a new challenge there, right? Um, some people might mention, though, so I'm kind of thinking about what some criticisms could be here. Well, in the U.S., there's a difference in the rate of Black entrepreneurship and Hispanic entrepreneurship. And you might say, well, why is that? Um, one of the main differences is immigrant culture versus chattel slavery background. Um, so they're oftentimes working as a family to generate intergenerational wealth, whereas some of the epigenetics that come from chattel slavery, where you're removed from your family, your marriages aren't respected, you're raised by biological strangers, that's gonna make a difference for your ability versus the talented immigrants that come. Remember, immigrants have a selection bias. That's not the whole country moving here. That's some of the more talented, privileged people coming here. So it's not really apples to apples comparison. Um, so now I'm going the other direction where I talked about challenges to black entrepreneurs, but there also were black venture capitalists who were seeking to invest their capital and they have challenges as well. So one of their main challenges <clears throat> is fundraising. Just like a business owner is trying to raise funds, venture capitalists also need to raise funds so that they can distribute said funds. And a lot of the channels through which venture capitalists get capital are traditional large white dominant institutions, uh, pension funds to a certain degree, investment firms, funds of funds, all these larger institutions, and it's hard to get capital there because those relationships might not be built. Co-investing. So a lot of VC projects are done, I was gonna say as a cartel, but I'll say more as a syndicate. So there's several VCs working together, risk sharing, pulling their capital together. So I really can do more than one project at a time. Um, so you need relationships with other VCs as well. And the gentleman before said, there's a 5% 5, 5 black development, real estate development in the city. For VC, the picture is, is much bleaker. Um, for attraction to VC capital, black entrepreneurs get about 2% of VC mm -hmm. capital. But in terms of black VCs as a percentage of all VC capital, that will probably be less than 1%. So the ability to call that's gonna be really hard there. Um, moving to the soft side again, VC is considered a value added capital. So a bank cuts you a check, a loan, a mortgage, a business loan, and the loan is just kind of, here you go. Um, unless you're talking about community uh, banking, which might have a little bit more hands-on, it's very hands-off and here's your loan, pay me back. VC, the VC is expected to bring expertise. The VC is gonna sit on the board of your firm. The VC is going to introduce you. The VC has got a problem solved with you. The VC wants to have a little bit more control in that relationship. Um, so a lot of times how VCs are picked is based off of their perceived value add. You know, if somebody in Silicon Valley has made Apple through their contributions, made Tesla, made Uber, they're gonna consider smart money. Versus if you don't have that perception, you might not be able to find the same investment opportunities as a black VC. So I haven't said anything about the pictures yet. This is my last bullet point. This is a movie that came out, I don't know, three years ago or something. And it's uh, based on historical fact, if you will. Uh, there was a Los Angeles bank, uh, black bank, the first Los Angeles black bank, and they actually played what you could call white face. So in order to avoid being perceived as a black bank, they had somebody who's not a banker at all, oh. who's actually their chauffeur, oh. stand in as the CEO while they ran in the background. I didn't watch that. So what does that mean? As a black venture capitalist, you might not always want to be labeled black venture capital. That might be considered less smart capital. So now you might have to find other avenues to market yourself than actually being forward as black VC. Uh, Pleads and Promises was the title of my paper, it's the title of my paper, because uh, with the Black Lives Matter from 2020, 
many um, promises were made. The pleads have been there for a long time. Please, we need more capital. Please, we're struggling with capital. And record promises were made in 2020. Um, and you'll see uh, from 2018 up to 2020, a large increase in venture capital flows to Black entrepreneurship. But as you can see here, it plummeted in 2020. So these were just kind of pleas. These were political statements to appear woke, apparently. Yeah. Uh, VC has gone down a further 6% in regards of VC flows to Black entrepreneurs since then. Um, this is the founder of Honey Pot, which is a woman's cosmetic um, producer. Uh, she was trying to get her product into Target. She succeeded in getting her product into Target, which is a major realtor, real, realtor in the U.S., um, but she was still making her stuff like in her bathroom tub at home. So she hadn't been able to achieve scale because she hadn't been able to get capital. So this is a pretty ridiculous example. Now, I just want to read a quote because it's too long for me to remember. Um, let me just find the quote on why venture capital, which was pledged to flow towards Black entrepreneurs is now doing what it traditionally does and flowing into white firms largely. Um, so this quote is from Marin Nichols. He's co-founder and managing partner of Mac Venture Capital. He is African-American. This is not his opinion, but he's describing what he's seen going on in his space. We've always invested in white men. Now, that's where we're comfortable. That's where we know and believe that we're going to get the return, is how Nichols, who is Black, described decisions made by some firms. This diversity thing is cool. We'll pick it back up maybe, you know, once we've weathered this storm. So that's the difference between plead and promises. So my conclusion is to instead of do, please give me money, I promise I'll give you money, we can actually incentivize this by looking at the risk return structure of Black venture capital of black entrepreneurs. So a lot of us may have or may not have heard the term, you have to be twice as good uh, just to get half as much. This is a term in regards to blacks as employees, but it could apply as entrepreneurs as well. Um, could apply as an investor as well. So when you see that capital is not flowing into a space where innovation and talent exists, that's when in finance we would call underpricing. And as an investor, if you want to buy low, you want to buy below value mm -hmm. so that you can get an abnormally high return. Um, there is something going on here, which you could call um, financial colonialism, mm -hmm. where white VCs are able to get larger shares of black firms because they're underpriced. So that's something to be concerned about. Um, Milton Laurier, Gary Becker, a long time ago, he mentioned that there's a cost for prejudice. It's a famous oh, paper wow. called You Pay for Prejudice. So if talent is equal and you prefer certain thing over something else, you're actually incurring a cost. And that could happen as lower returns as an investor as well. So one of the solutions I suggest is to make more transparency. So if it's common knowledge that a certain stock is undervalued, capital is going to flow into that. For VC, there's not public prices. So it's not common knowledge that certain spaces of uh, entrepreneurship are being underfunded. So it would be uh, to the benefit of Black entrepreneurs to make it clear what their financials are, to advertise what the opportunity is. Um, and if the market and private equity became more transparent, then the markets could not perfectly correct it, but start to begin to correct it. Uh, so with that, I conclude. Thank you, Professor. Before um, the, um, the professor goes, do we have any questions, comments, concerns? Yeah, this is, I really like what you're doing with dilution. Um, there's two sides of dilution, right? So you've got, you've also got, if you're doing multiple stages in raising funds, yeah. then you're diluting your shareholders too. So it'd be really interested to see if the, if the African American, let's say black shareholders, because there's other people who are not necessarily American, they're also from Africa, right. might be investing. So let's, so it would be interesting to see if the, uh, if, if the other side of the equation was an unfavorable form of dilution compared to non-black. For coals. Oh, no, for, so like, 
So when you do, you know, you, you'll, you'll do different stages of plant yeah. in BC, right? And so it'd be interesting to see if the investors that are coming in who are um, black investors are also being more heavily diluted than white investors, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. See what I'm saying? There's two yeah. sides. I think it's really yeah, interesting. That would be a good, good thing to do. It's, it's really interesting because it's a good quantitative indicator and it's extremely unambiguous. And then you've got a really good story behind the behind that the indicator. narrative and then the numbers. Yeah, we hate uh, qualitative data. We just throw it out in finance. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you for that. Question? Yeah. So I think it's a very interesting uh, work. So really appreciate it. Uh, so one thought was coming to my mind that you look at uh, common data across the world, like with the BRIC plus countries, okay. that there's a lot of similarity in terms of the developing nations. So if you yes. look at some of those uh, data that comes from the yeah. country yeah. and then pull them out, yeah. because it can give you a prediction also. That right, what so the developing world akin to the black world within correct. the US. Correct, correct. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Yeah, nice, nice evolution to your um your paper. Yeah, yeah, this is great. great. Anybody else have a question? Oh, um, so does that mean that we should be looking for undervalued stock, perhaps? Yes. yes. Yeah. So whether it's a public traded company or a private company, which is harder to invest in, you should be looking for undervalued. The trick is to find a model that defines undervalued in a good way. But yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly right. Do you right. have any suggestions, Professor? Yeah, I do. Yeah, you know, that's a family well, well, finance guy. I think that whenever there's certain psychological biases at play, that's an opportunity to find undervalued. And can, I can talk about that. Can, can you give us one or two keys to what that actually means? I'll give you one example. Uh, Chinese superstition against the number four. Four okay. in Chinese is similar in their language to the word death. And so there's certain um, serial numbers of stocks on the Chinese market that have fours in it, and they avoid those stocks. If you don't have that superstition, the Chinese superstition has made it cheaper for you, but it doesn't mean the company is worse. Look, if you want to do it right, you wait till oh, a big drop. Yeah, I'll shut up. Never mind. <laughs> so um, I think this is really great, and I'm curious if you're getting this type of knowledge in the um, you know, to high schoolers and young college people. And the reason why, especially, is because in some um, disadvantaged communities, they don't know what a BC is, angel investment, mm -hmm. okay. equity, yeah. the differences. And so true. I'm hoping that, I, I, I know this reaches your undergraduate students, but I wish yeah. it could reach broader, because I think this is like really- That ties into the panel earlier, where um, Joshua Brown, the real estate developer, said he was having a tough time getting traditional banking capital and access to VC capital, capital is easier for him. Same thing with black entrepreneurs um, in certain communities. If they're having tough times getting business loans, which is a challenge sometimes, they might not be aware of it's turning up channel. So that would be good to, to raise awareness then. Kind of, you know. another, another segment to curriculum can actually really expand Look at that. Um, down to high school list. We have another question. Well, as a uh, uh, I, you know, here I have a NASA girl, and I've seen it in DC, 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 as I'm looking at investments and all, and I really never understood it until just. Oh, um, I, well, that's what this is all about. Yeah. Great. Right. Gotta get to the question. Uh, yeah, fascinating subject. Um, but what I'd like to just draw to your attention that I'm from the UK, and unfortunately, um, the the role of the what is portrayed as a banker is still very much um, to the fore. Now, I I've, I've over the years even I've been approached and and forgive me if I offend anyone. Uh, the words were "You're a white face." People like to see a white face. Mm -hmm. Now that to me was insulting, and hence the conversation didn't go any further. The true verse, <laughs> but. You know, um, can you see when when this might break? You know, any any solution that, that, that I know it's not a quick fix. One one quick answer, not to say, oh, this is when it will break predictably. Um, there have been some studies in 2022, 2023 on returns for black venture capitalists, right. and they have higher returns than white venture capitalists on average. If that were well known then you wouldn't have to hide behind white right. face as a black venture capitalist. Right. 
That's why your study is important. If you can get it high, yeah. then yeah. then if you need a journal of finance and yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's a good suggestion. We have another question in the back. Yeah. Appreciate your presentation. But on the on the last slide, you mentioned policy implications or uh, you mentioned transparency and awareness. Can you say more about that? Um, just... Right. Um, so private equity right now is very untransparent. And that's one of the things that investors in private equity enjoy is they don't have to say report to Security Exchange Commission the way a public company would. Um, as a result, how well their investments are doing or not doing is not known to the public. But one of the solutions is for it to become aware what kind of returns you can get from investing in black entrepreneurs. If it becomes aware that their risk adjusted returns are high, capital will flow in that direction. So the whole veil over private equity where you can't see what's going on is part of why it's Thank you, Professor Zoll. Thank you so much. Is um, Professor, is it the right? Thank you. Um, we're gonna go back to um,